So thankful that you've joined us this morning. We do want to welcome everybody on a Mother's Day like this. We know we have lots of guests, lots of moms visiting kids and kids visiting moms. So we're thankful uh, that you've joined us this morning. We got a couple things coming up. Next Sunday uh, is a com- uh, celebration Sunday, rather. But right before that is what we're calling a 24 hours of prayer. And so we'd love to lead into celebration Sunday next week with 24 hours of prayer. And this is going to be Saturday night, Saturday, Friday, Saturday into Sunday. And so if you would scan the code there, you can do that right now. You can do that later this week in our church email. You'll see the code come back out. But we would love to bathe this project in prayer. And then Celebration Sunday, it's a neat day where we mention and tell the the total number of pledges that's coming in for our building program. But we just want to have a vigil of prayer, you might call it, before Celebration Sunday. So if you would... Let's be a church of prayer. Let's make this a house of prayer. And this isn't uh, some, something where you have to come into the church to do this. You do this at your, at your home, uh, wherever you are, and just take a 15-minute slot to pray over what God is doing here at our church. Talking about Celebration Sunday again, that is next week. You're not going to want to miss that. We're going to have a lot of extra food. Ashley's been busy coordinating the extra food. It's going to be good stuff, right? Uh, lots of extra food, so come on out. We've got uh, T-bone steaks. We're uh, serving 8 a.m. in the morning. No, that's not actually. <laughs> so suddenly, I was like getting better uh, response than I expected on that one. Not getting steaks, but we're going to have some expanded food options and just a time of celebration next week. And just a reminder, you can fill out pledge cards. Maybe you brought them back today. You can put them in the offering boxes. Grab a pledge card from the uh, Connect desk or scan the code. You can uh, do a digital pledge card as well. We would love to have everybody participate in this process. Everybody pray and think, what would God have you to do to give towards this project of building beyond walls? And that is the theme of our project. It's the theme of our campaign. That's the theme of the book of Nehemiah. And so I'd have you this morning open to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we're going to be in our text of scripture this morning. And you're looking at me thinking, oh my goodness, it's Mother's Day. Why are you still preaching out of Nehemiah? (laughs) Anybody thinking that? Uh, Well, because we needed to kind of move forward in Nehemiah. And I thought about going somewhere else, and never in a million years would I ever think that a good Mother's Day text would be in the book of Nehemiah, but here we are. And I was walking through this text this week, and it was just a gift. It dropped into my lap here. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 15 has so many important things for us as God's people to apply to our lives and so many important things for mothers to apply to your life as well. And as we walk through Nehemiah 9, you're going to quickly see the relevance to motherhood. Motherhood is is not easy. Maybe some of you feel like the mom in this picture. Super mom, called upon to do what amazing super people can do. Maybe that's that's how you feel today. I have this reading that I enjoy uh, each year. I kind of review it in my mind, and I've read this before, but this is just a little description of moms. A mother appears to be a normal human being. She has all the physical features that people have. Two eyes, two hands, two arms, two feet, all connected to one body. Now that is what you see if you just look on the exterior of a mother. But if you were ever a child, you will know that she has at least three sets of eyes. Two in front, two in back, so she can see all those things she must see but that are hidden from her. And one on each side of her head so that she can protect the cookie jar no matter where she stands in the kitchen. All capable, however, of seeing through wood and plaster so she can tell what's going on behind closed doors. Ever have that sense, Mom? I think I need to go check in on this. They're a little too quiet in that room. She has also bionic ears. She can hear a dirty word whispered a block away. She can hear a complaint that is only thought when unpleasant tasks are assigned to her kids. With her many arms and hands, she can prepare a meal find dad's shirt, change a diaper, run the vacuum, and spank two kids all at the same time. With strong, fast legs, she can move about the house like a speeding bullet. She patrols all the streets, stops a fight in the backyard, catches a tennis ball before it's flushed on the toilet, and prevents a child from falling out of a tree all simultaneously. Her endless supply of energy can only be a God-given attribute. She's the first to rise in the morning. She has breakfast ready for the brood as they get up. 
gets each of the children ready for school, is both a barber and a beautician, a fashion consultant, a chairman, a budget director, a purchasing agent, a paramedic, a mechanic, a veterinarian, an interpreter, a travel agent, an interior decorator, and is the last one to go to bed at night. With a tender kiss, she can heal everything from a cut finger to a broken heart. With a kiss, she can convince a balding 50-year-old man that he is just as handsome as he ever was. Her ability to love is exceeded only by God's love itself. Her love grows with her children, and it is impossible to tell the success or failure of her children by her love. There are no depths to which a child can fall that will diminish her love and no heights of success a child can achieve that will increase it. Her love is protective, tender, consistent, understanding, forgiving, unchanging, unselfish, giving, contagious, comfortable, and everlasting. The nearest thing we can see in this world to God's love is a mother's love. And there's so much truth to that. And so what we want to do this morning is we want to exalt in the goodness of God. We want to exalt in the knowledge of God. And I want to encourage you today, moms. I want to encourage all of us who are here today. But listen, looking deeply into the character of God can put meat and bones on your mothering and encourage the task. Because you see in God's relationship with you the grace and the goodness, and then you replicate that to the kids that God has put in your home. And really, it's the same for any of us, whether you're your mother or, or not a mother or a man or a kid, that when you see how good God is, it is very difficult to not be good to those around us. So this morning, as we walk through this text in Nehemiah chapter 9, I just thought of Nehemiah, you know, uh, helping a bunch of children uh, undergo the biggest cleanup task in the history of Jerusalem. <laughs> Go clean your rooms. <laughs> Go clean Jerusalem up. Kind of some parallels there. What we're going to see this morning, this big idea is this, that we should recognize and replicate the goodness of God. Recognize and replicate the goodness of God. We're going to start here in chapter 9. We were in chapter 8 last week. We saw the Word of God coming to bear on the hearts of the people. They had been absent of the Word of God for a long time, so absent from the Word of God, they'd actually forgotten about a, a festival, a holiday that God had prescribed. They had been so removed from God's Word that they didn't even remember to celebrate certain things that God told them to celebrate. And the Word of God comes to bear on their life, and it begins to change them. We see changes instantly here in chapter 8. And they were moved and wanted to confess and repent of their sins, but the leadership held them off and said, just wait, we're going to celebrate first. And so now we come to chapter 9, where they confess, verses 1 through 5. Now, I'm going to skip that. We're going to jump into the next section where they have a hymn of praise about God's goodness. We're going to look at the hymn of praise first, and then we're going to go back and look at the confession at the end of the sermon. But let's watch how this text unfolds, verses 6 through 15, first of all, is led into by a call to worship. The end of verse 5, it says, Stand up, blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. A call to worship. And now we're into a song about the goodness of God. And verses 6 through 15 reveal this to us, that God's heart is filled with goodness. God's heart is filled with goodness. And where is it that we see the goodness in God's heart? Well, look with me at verse 6. It says, you, Lord, are the only God. Literally, you, Yahweh, are the only Elohim. Two words for God there. You are the only God. You created the heavens, verse 6, the highest stars, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them. And that phrase, give life to all of them, literally means that you hold and bind everything together, like it says in Colossians chapter 1 about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the stars of heaven worship you better than stars actually should be the heavenly hosts. It's talking about the heavenly beings, the angelic hosts bow down and they worship God. And so we see that creation reveals his goodness. 
that God's goodness is seen in the things that he has made. God created the world and all that is in it so that it would point to his glory, point to his goodness, point to his majesty. He did this for our benefit to see and enjoy his goodness and his greatness. Now, we live in a sin-cursed world. Everybody knows that, right? And so creation is not as it was intended at the beginning. We all understand that there's days in January that are so cold that only Satan can be said to be behind those cold days. Can I get an amen? You understand what I mean? Yeah. It is a sin-cursed world, and there's tornadoes. And the, but the truth remains that this is God's earth. This is my Father's world, and He created it for His glory, and He's going to set it straight and return it to its original factory setting someday under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Creation reveals His goodness. I want you to see in verses 7 and 8 that election also reveals His goodness. And I'm not talking about the election in November. <laughs> Please don't I'll confuse that. When I say the word election, I mean the word predestination. I mean that God chooses people to save them. And this is laid out for us in verses 7 and 8 about Abraham. He says, You, the Lord, are the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur the Chaldees and changed his name to Abraham. Who was Abraham before God chose him? You want to know who he was? He was a nobody. He was just like the countless masses of people that lived in that day who were ranching and shepherding and living their lives to other gods other than the one true and living God. Abraham's dad and his grandfather and probably him, actually himself, they were idol worshipers. God did not look down and see Abraham and think, oh my goodness, that dude is a mega stud. He needs to be on team God. That's not what he said. He looked down and he saw a normal person, a normal sinner, a normal idol worshiper, and said, I'm going to choose that person to make my name great through him. And I love the sequence because you see in verse 7, you chose Abraham, you changed his name, and then verse 8, notice what happens in verse 8, and then you found his heart faithful in your sight. What precedes Abraham's heart being faithful? It's that God chose him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Then he finds his heart faithful and makes a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Gergesites, and the Mosquito Bites. <laughs> I'm sorry. Every time that's in the text, I have to say it. It's a low-hanging fruit, all right? Some of you heard that many times. Some of you are new. That was the first time. You're like, man, he's clever. No, I just repeat things a lot, all right? So God made this covenant to do what? To give Abraham a ridiculous amount of very valuable real estate. Why? Just because. Just because he's God and he's good. And so as you look through these verses, you just realize, man, God is good. And every single one of us that's sitting here this morning that knows the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you should wake up every day and say, thank you, Lord, for choosing to save me. Thank you, God. Why me? Out of the masses of people in this world, why did you choose me? Why did you choose to take your Holy Spirit to open my eyes through God's word to see the glory of Jesus Christ in salvation? Huh? God is good. His goodness is displayed in creation. His goodness is displayed in his election. We also see that deliverance also reveals his goodness, verses 9 through 12. And now we're getting into the history of the people of Israel. In verse 9, you saw the oppression of our ancestors in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. I like how this starts. God's going to deliver them. But listen, before God delivers them, God hears them. And I don't know about you, but maybe there have been times. In fact, I know there have been times in your life that you have cried out to the Lord for help, for deliverance. And you need to know, friend, that God hears those cries, and God cares about you. You may not see the deliverance right away. You may not even see the deliverance in your lifetime, but God hears, and he has compassion, and he will someday part the waters and lead you through the Red Sea and deliver you. He will. Yeah. And that's what it says. 
Verse 10, you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all the people of this land, for you knew how arrogantly they treated our ancestors and made a name for yourself. Now, it doesn't work exactly like that. Dear Lord, you know that my boss, man, he's a really rough person. I pray that you would bring the plagues of Egypt down in my boss's house someday. It doesn't work like that, okay? But you can know that in his time, he will deliver. It says in verse 11, you divided the sea before them. They crossed through on a dry ground. You hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone of the raging water. You led them with a pillar of cloud by day, with a pillar of fire by night to illuminate the way that they should go. God will deliver in his time. God's deliverance. And likely you have experienced God's deliverance at some point in your life already. And if not, you will. We also see that God's revelation reveals his goodness as well. When I say the word revelation, I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. I'm talking about God revealing himself to us. God does no longer reveal himself to us through signs and wonders and dreams and visions. God reveals himself to us through this book, the Word of God. This is the complete and total revelation of God to us, and this book is sufficient. We need nothing else than this. And God's goodness is revealed in that. And that's what it says here. Verse 13 and 14, you came down from Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. So there was a voice, and then what did the voice result in? You gave them impartial ordinances and reliable instructions and good statutes and commands. What did God give them? He gave them the law. Now, in our day and age, in the church age, we, say, we tend to say the word law with kind of some derision and like, ugh, the law, Right? Now, the law is not a bad thing. It was a good thing. It revealed the heart of God. It revealed the goodness of God. It gave them ordinance. It gave them statutes. It gave them a way to have an orderly society. It gave them a way to make themselves right before the Lord. Look at the positive language that's used to describe the law. But also part of the law is great care for the people. Verse 14, you revealed your holy Sabbath to them and gave them commands and statutes and instructions. So inside the law, there's this idea of the Sabbath. You know, God says, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to take a day off. Take a day off. Rest. Work six. Rest on the seventh. And worship. This is for your own good. God's goodness is revealed in this. Finally, in verse 15, we have his provision for us reveals his goodness. Now, what I love about the way that this text progresses, as you're thinking about how God is good in your life, if you were to list God's goodness, if you were to pray about God's goodness, most of our prayers usually start like this. Heavenly Father, what's, what's next? Thank you for this day. How many of you start prayers like that? It's okay, raise your hands, fine. Start prayers, I start prayers like that all the time. Thank you for this day. Now, if you were to say, let's start praying and thanking God for his goodness, what comes next? Usually, Lord, I'm so thankful for the job that you've given us. Thank you for the great food. Thank you for the housing. Like we, we jump, we run right to provisions, don't we? And that's not a bad thing because God does provide plenteously for us. But I love how this text progresses because it doesn't start with the provisions. It puts the provisions last. God, you are good in creation. God, you are good in electing us to salvation. God, you are good for delivering us. God, you are good for revealing yourself through your word. And oh, by the way, God, yeah, also you're good and thank you for the stuff. That's the progression. The stuff is last. Isn't that that cool? That kind of changes the way that you pray. And it says in verse 15, here's the stuff. You provided bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water from the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land that you'd sworn to give them. God's goodness revealed in his provision. As a mom, you may feel like you give and you give and you give and you give and you're good and you're good and you're good and you just maybe don't receive the thanks back that you wish you could or deserve. Don't raise your hands. But moms, did anybody feel like that? There was a, a fake job posting. This is a while back. They, they were actually putting a, a job description of a mother, but they phrased it, they titled it a director of operations. This was on a legit job website. There were 2.7 million people that clicked on this posting for a director of operations. And under that, they, they listed the job description, and it said this, 
the requirements for the job, must be able to work 135 hours per week. Must be willing to work overnights. Able to lift 75 pounds on a regular basis. To manage 10 to 15 projects at a time. Crisis management skills necessary. Excellent communication skills necessary. Ability to work with associates with minimal ability. <laughs> That one's funny. <laughs> Knowledge of counseling and culinary arts, understanding of medicine, and minivan driving experience necessary. 2.7 million people clicked on this. 24 people applied. And they actually did interviews with those 24 people. You can, there's a video of this. this is, it's funny stuff. And finally, at the end, they realize and they reveal that this is the job description of a mom, and they're like, oh, my goodness. You know, obviously, this was a, the reaction to these people. You're walking through the, the job description, and they just can't believe this is real. But it's not real, is it? The expectations of a mother are huge. The expectations of being a mom are something that just really you, you can't be done on your own. But as you walk through the heart of God, as you walk through who God is, you see that there's this mirror, this reflection of who you are as a mother, who you are as a parent, and who God is to us as a parent, and the goodness that just continually rolls out of his heart. God's heart is filled with goodness. And so because God's heart is filled with goodness, how do we respond to that? How do we tend to respond to that? I want you to see the second part of, of these verses here this morning, starting in verse 16. Here's the truth of it. Number two, our hearts are filled with rebellion. What? Why? God's heart is continually filled with goodness. And then in response, our hearts are what? Filled with rebellion. What is going on? Sometimes as a mom, you're like, I don't understand this. Well, let's get a description of who we are in this rebellion. Starting in verse 16, but our ancestors acted arrogantly. They became stiff-necked and did not listen to your commands. Just walk through each of these words, stiff-necked. So arrogant, prideful, prideful. We think our way is best. We do not want to be told what to do. Does that uh, kind of ring true as a parent? Prideful. The word stubborn or stiff-necked, I like that word stiff-necked. You can see when somebody really digs in on something. Their face kind of gets tight and their neck gets tight like this. You can tell that stubbornness is setting in. And that word's used a couple times here in the text. They became stiff-necked, arrogant, stiff-necked. Next one, they did not listen to your commands. They didn't listen to your commands. What do you call this? You call this unteachable. Unteachable. It's like when you show a kid how to do something. Maybe you're coaching. You show a kid how to do something. You tell a kid something they need to do, and they respond. I hate this. They respond and say, I know. Hey, anybody else that really grinds your gears? Anybody with me on that? I know. No, no, no. You don't know. And here's why you don't know. Because if you knew, you would already be doing it. Right? Right? Don't say, I know, say, yes, mom. Okay, can I get an amen from the moms? Yeah. I want every child in here this morning, right now, say, yes, mom. Ready? Yes, mom. Well, that was terrible, <laughs> terrible. Let's try it again. Every kid in here, ready? Yes, mom. All right, practice that this week. Yes, mom. You didn't listen, says, about the children of Israel. Unteachable. Also forgetful. Look what it says in verse 17. They refused to listen. They did not remember your wonders. They forgot. God had been so good to them, constantly good to them, constantly providing for them. They forgot. Forgot. Forgetful. That's who we are. Also, ungrateful. All of this roots back to ungratefulness. And then the kicker on all of this in verse 17, it says, they became stiff-necked and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. What? God delivered them out of slavery. God brought them out of this oppressive regime, and then they tried to set up a leader to bring them back to slavery. And if you study the Old Testament, the main reason why they wanted to go back into slavery was because the food was better in slavery. Now, how petty and ridiculous is that? We liked the food better when we were slaves. 
Oh, okay, that, that, that's, that's real cool. And set up a leader to bring them back to slavery. That's who we are. But who is God? God's heart's constantly filled with goodness. Our heart's constantly filled with this prideful rebellion. How does God respond to that? How do you typically respond to that as a person when you're working with other people? What's your normal response? Well, fine. Now have it your way, right? How does God respond to that? Verse 17. But. In middle of 17. But. I have that underlined. But. Here's God. You are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. God's response to our rebellion? What is God's response to our rebellion? Here it is. Ready? On the screen. God's response to our rebellion? More, good, what, more goodness? Are you serious? And as a mom, you might be sitting here thinking, yep, I get it. Right? You love and you love and you love and maybe there's not the kind of response you want back and more goodness. We're reflecting the heart of our Father. And so the rest of these verses now, they unfold what God's continued goodness looks like in the face of our unexplainable pride, rebellion, arrogance, and unteachableness. Here's what it looks like. God continues to be good to us. How does He continue to be good to us? Well, it says here in verse 18, even after they had cast an image of a calf for themselves and said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. What? God brings you out of Egypt, and then you want to make, him, make an image of him, and that's the best you can come up with. Here's a cow. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Kids, please do not make an idol of your mom that looks like a cow. Okay, that's a really bad idea. But you can see how insulting that this would be to the Lord God. They make a cow and say, this is what brought us out of Egypt. Look what it says there in verse 18. And they had committed terrible blasphemies. But verse 19, what does God do? But you did not abandon them. How does God continue to show goodness? He claims us. He continues to claim us. I'll never forget in our adoption hearing for our two sons, the judge would walk through. The judge says, this is a family bond. There's no difference in the eyes of the law between this child and a natural-born child. All the rights, privileges, of inheritance of this child, there's no, this is a forever decision. And then the judge looked up. It is, he had reading glasses, looked up. He says, you know, this applies even when they're teenagers, right? That's what he told us. Like, yeah, we know. It's good. We have, we have, a, we have a good teenager. I say that, one, because we only have one teenager right now. Some of you are like, did he just say just one of them? No, we only have one teenager. He's a good teenager. God still claims us. Let's go on to the next verse here. What else does God do for us? He still claims us, and God also still counsels us, verse 19. And I use the word counsel in the, in the words of, like, guidance, the idea of, like, guidance. And so God continues to guide these children of Israel. You did not abandon them because of your great compassion. During the day, the pillar of cloud never turned away from them, the guiding them on their journey. And during the night, the pillar of fire, illuminating the way that they should go. God continued to guide them, even though they wanted to go their own way. He says, no, you're not going to go your own way. You're going to follow me, and I'm going to continue to give you guidance. Last week, I was driving on 8035 Southeast, uh, crossing Douglas Parkway around that. You know what I'm talking about? I was cruising along 65 miles an hour at the speed limit, maybe 80, but cruising along there in the left lane. There was a shoulder right there, and then off to the shoulder, off to the left, there was a cement barricade to keep you from going in the other way of traffic. And in this shoulder, there's a goose with little geese behind her. just cruising along, and they're in tow. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is a disaster. They were just marching forward four lanes of traffic in the shoulder, a cement barricade on one side, and all this dangerous traffic to the right of them. Now, Bob Brown Chevrolet is over 
off to the side, and there's, there's some grass, there's some construction, there's some, you know, water. I'm sure that's where they came from, and they crossed the interstate looking for greener pastures, looking for somewhere else, and I'm thinking to myself, they're never going to find it. They're going to keep running down miles of pavement in front. They're never going to find what they're looking for. They are so misguided right now. And suddenly, like, click in my mind. I'm like, hey, they're the children of Israel, thinking they can go their own way. Miles of pavement. Then it clicked in my mind. Hey, those, those geese are, are me, doing my own thing, moving away from the place of blessing, crossing dangerous traffic to get to somewhere I think I need to be. And now I'm lost. I've lost my way. I'm doomed. I could die. And you know, at that point, God could easily say, just forget it. If you didn't like where I had you, just forget it. But instead, God will always guide us out of that. God will always lovingly bring us across those lanes of traffic back to the place where we're supposed to be. God continues to counsel, to guide. But you see, thirdly, God continues to comfort as well. Verse 20, moms, you should be hearing each of these and thinking, yes, yes, and yes. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. In the New Testament, the spirit is called the comforter. A mom's job is to continually comfort the kids. Even when the kids maybe are, are going astray a little bit, to comfort the kids, even if they're obstinate, to comfort the kids, to comfort them. Look at verse 20, the end of verse 20 then. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths. All right, look at the screen, wait for it. Ready for this next one? Wait for it. He still cooks for them. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I told you. This just fell into my lap this week. This is awesome. Look what it says in verse 20. You did not withhold your manner, manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. The way it says that in verse 20, you did not withhold your manna or water. The way it says it makes it sound to me like God thought about starving them out. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like that to you? They did all this stuff, but he kept feeding, he kept cooking for them, even though he really felt like starving them out. I'll let you process that, moms. It's okay. Still cooks for them. Verse 21. Still cares for us. You provided for them in the wilderness 40 years, and they lacked nothing. Last part of verse 21. Still clothed, clothed them. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Clothed them. Still provide, even when the gratefulness is not there. It says here they lacked nothing in the wilderness for 40 years. Sometimes I ask my kids, I'm like, are you fed? Yes. Clothed? Yes. Have a bed at night? Yes. Have a loving family? Yes. What reason is there to ever be grumpy or have any attitude at all? That's what I ask them. And then I think of myself with my God, who says the same thing to me. What right do you have to ever issue a complaint after all the goodness that just floods out of my heart all the time? How do we respond to this? God's heart's filled with goodness. Our heart's filled with rebellion. God responds to our rebellion with what? More goodness. What should we do? Back to chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Here's what we should do. Therefore, we should confess and recognize and replicate God's goodness. And so this whole section started with confession and then they went into praise. I want to start with the praise and go back to the confession. Because in the light of God's goodness, in the light of God's grace, in the light of God's a greatness in our lives, it should lead us to confession of our sins and drawing close to our God who so dearly loves us. It says in verse 1 of chapter 9, on the 24th day of this month, the Israelites assembled, they were fasting, they were wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. What does it look like to come and confess? What does it look like to draw near to your God in confession? First, it looks like a willingness for contrition, to contri for contrition, to be sorry to be contrite. They had sackcloth and ashes on their heads. Sackcloth was likely made of camel's hair. And no, it's not cashmere. This is like itchiness to the max. Camel's hair to show that they're contrite, they're sorry for their sin. Verse 2, a willingness to cut off sin. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. 
They cut off from other influences. And when you confess to your God, you need to cut off those sinful influences. If you struggle with a certain sin, make sure you cut off where you sin, where you fall into that sin. If you struggle with things that you click on on a screen, find ways to safeguard yourself. If you struggle with alcohol, you shouldn't go to a bar with friends. Cut off from the sin. Be contrite. Cut off the sin. It says at the end here of verse 2, they confessed the sin. So there's a confession, a willingness to confess, a willingness to say, I'm sorry, God. And though you are already forgiven, you say, I'm sorry, to restore the fellowship with your God. And then in verses 4 and 5, a willingness to celebrate as well. And so at the end of verse 4, they were on a raised platform. The Levites cried out loudly to their God. And then the Levites, and it lists their name, says, middle of verse 5, stand up, blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. The confession, when we confess sin, it should never stay in a mode of being sullen and sad and self-deprecating. That's not what it's supposed to look like. You confess your sin and you run to Jesus. You confess your sin and you know that your debt has been paid and you have the righteousness of Jesus on your behalf and you celebrate the forgiveness that you have and you celebrate the fact that no matter what I do and no matter how much of a dimwit that I am with my God, He always forgives and restores. Amen? Amen. Celebrate it. Praise God for His forgiveness. Praise God that there's second chances. Not second chances. Praise God that there's 245th chances. Amen? Amen. Right? And celebrate God's goodness. And so moms... Dads, kids, anybody here this morning, drink in the knowledge of God today. This is who our God is to us. This is how you should be to others around us. God's heart is constantly good. Our hearts are constantly rebellious. God responds with more goodness. Therefore, confess that sin. It's going to be over and over again. It's going to happen. Confess that sin. Draw near to your God recognize and replicate that to other people. This is a, a special Mother's Day for me. I was able to have my mom around this weekend. She was here in the first service. And after the first service, they left and they're going to drive to Newton to go to church with my sister. And so I, I was hoping she'd be around here all the services because after all, I, I do know that she likes me better than my sister. Um, <laughs> but it didn't happen like that. So she's uh, going to church with my sister in Newton right now. But I just wanted to say thanks to my mom and just kind of bring this home a little bit. This is me and my mom together. This is last night. I grabbed her last night. I said, hey, mom, come out here to the deck. She said, what for? I said, don't worry about it. Just do what I say. <laughs> I'm at a stage in life. I can do that now. It's so much fun. So I slipped, slipped my wife the, the phone. I said, take a picture of us. So I took a picture. And after I got the picture, I said, thanks, mom. I'm going to put that picture up on the screen in church tomorrow. That's why I didn't say what I was doing before I took the picture because I knew there'd be some protest. I took the picture. She was here this morning, saw the picture together. And I was privileged to have my mom, privileged to have a great mom that loved the Lord and raised us that way. Thankful that she was always so patient and she was always so loving and caring, even when, even when I wasn't. And most of the time I wasn't. Most of the time I wasn't. Thankful to my mom for making me continue piano lessons, even when I was so awful. I made her cry repeatedly in practicing the piano. And my dad had to come up and referee the fights between us. And he said, you respect your mom or there's going to be consequences with me. Thanks, mom, for pushing through that. Thankful that my mom would bring me hot lunch to school. I was spoiled. That's probably why I am the way I am today, right? She would come to the church. My Christian school was at my church. Small school, I had four people in my class in second grade. My dad's office was next door. That's rough, by the way. The teacher just walked next door to tell my dad what, you know, that, that happens sometimes. Instead of go to the principal's, go to your dad's office. Like, that's terrifying. <laughs> Mom would come over to meet my dad for lunch, and she would bring me hot lunch. Everybody else was eating cold lunch. She'd bring me hot lunch. Thanks, Mom, for that. Mom... Thank you for buying me clothes even when I was ungrateful and said I didn't like the clothes that you bought. 
Thanks, Mom. In short, thanks, Mom, for showing me the heart of my Heavenly Father. So grateful. As we close this morning, maybe you can be grateful for your mother as well. If that's a struggle or a strain, I can tell you this, that every single one of us can be grateful for the wonderful giving and good heart of our Heavenly Father. Fill out a Connect card for us. Write down any prayer requests you have. Maybe as a next step this morning, you just simply write down how you can recognize better and replicate better the heart of God in His goodness to other people. Take a moment, write that down. And we're going to sing as we close about the 10,000 reasons that we have to give God praise.